Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us in this first edition of a three-part series discussing Nabil Qureshi's new book, No God But One. We're privileged today to be joined by David Wood, who Nabil dedicated the book to. I will read you the inscription. This book is dedicated to David Wood, a great friend and total doofus. David, welcome. We're glad you're with us. Oh, I, I just have to, uh, uh, since you have primarily English-speaking viewers, um, they think that Nabil's calling me a doofus there, whereas uh, <laughs> Nabil actually speaks four languages fluently, and uh, uh, the Punjabi word is doofus, and it's, uh, we don't actually have a translation, which is why he kept the Punjabi, um, but it means something along the lines of a mentor, although much stronger than that. Um, if you think of like what Yoda was to Luke Skywalker, that would be the closest thing you can imagine to a doofus. So he's he's actually paying me a, a, a tremendous compliment there. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Uh, well, uh, we we know that you're an apologist and uh, you have a longstanding friendship uh, with Nabil as well. We, we'd love to hear a funny story if you can think of one. Oh, I can think of about 50. Um, <laughs> there's a... Uh, preferably really, something, preferably something incriminating or humiliating would be best. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, let me think. Um, r really, really, from the from the from the very first day when when we met, and we we had we, we met on the uh, speech and debate team, and um, the very first day we met there were four guys on the team and one we were all we were all friends but uh one was like really flamboyant uh homosexual named richard who referred to himself as uh madonna with a rupaw twist and uh nabil and i were just weren't very secure in our our manhood to to go into you know richard's room with him so we uh, we ended up sharing a hotel room um, there and then our, our friend Sarad was uh, ended up staying with us too, and so it's uh, it, that's that's how we we really started off as um, as uh, as friends, and then just going down um, uh, over the years. Uh, really, uh, Nabil's just a blast to hang out with. He's the he's the world champion of uh, of of puns, and just off the top of his head, every 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 other thing that comes out of his mouth is. A pun, um, and it will be quick. I would say, hurry up and finish your. He had a, he had a. We had a mushroom. We each had a mushroom sandwich, and uh, I would say, hurry up and finish your sandwich. We got to go, and he can't. Uh, he would say, I can't. I don't have mushroom left, and you know, it's just, <laughs> you know, I remember these puns years later because they're they're so dumb. Um, but really, I mean, uh, when when he told me that he uh, had become a Christian and, and I didn't get it because I'm a little, uh, I'm a little slow with things. And he'd been so stubborn for so long. Uh, I mean, over four years. And um, when he told the group that we were in that he was a Christian and uh, did it by asking to bless our food and bless the food in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm just thinking to myself, wow, that's uh, he's even, he's been hanging out with us so long. He's even a he's he's even praying like a Christian because he'd been walking around with the Bible for because he was hanging out with us and he would go to Bible studies with us. He would carry around a Bible, and I'm always thinking this is hilarious that you've got this Muslim walking around with the Bible in his hand like he's a Christian, and uh, and so I was thinking that you know, hey, now he's now he's he's praying like a Christian even, and uh, so really just I mean from from the from the from the day we met um, to all the way through to the time he converted. Um, when we weren't uh, ferociously arguing with each other, we were usually cracking up about uh, about something. It's awesome to hear some of that background and just see how God uses friendships and humor and common interests and even uh, argumentativeness to change people's minds over time. So uh, pretty awesome to hear, hear that story. Um, before we dive into some of the discussion, I uh, just wanted to let our audience know that we are actually going to do a book giveaway during this one hour discussion. Um, all you got to do to um, get your name in the hat for that drawing is send an email uh, during this discussion. This is my low tech way to uh, give you the email to Nabil Qureshi site at gmail.com. So send us an email uh, during this discussion, and you will be eligible for a signed copy of No God But One that we will mail to you. 
Um, also, if you have questions during the discussion, there's a chat feed on uh, Zondervan's YouTube channel that you can participate in. And you can also send any questions to that email address. I'll be watching it as we talk here. Um, just to remind you as well, we have two more discussions scheduled, one January 25th with Dr. Michael Whitmer, and then another on February 1st with Fuad Masri, the president of Crescent Project. So looking forward to those other two as well. Um, let me tee this up, David, with kind of a, a, a first question. We're, we're talking about Sharia or gospel today. It's kind of the first section of Nabil's book. Um, he brings up some of the surprising similarities between Islam and Christianity. And I'd just like to get your take on that. It kind of blew me away as I was learning, too, about Islam, that Muslims think uh, of Jesus as the Messiah. In fact, he's called that numerous times in the Quran. Um, they acknowledge his miracles. Uh, they acknowledge that he is in heaven today and that he will return someday. Um, what, are, what are some of the other similarities that, uh, that uh, Nabil brings out that you guys have studied? Well, um, you, you have sort of the um, the uh, theological uh, similarities that uh, that all theists, all monotheists, would share in common. So, um, the universe was created by one God who you know upholds and sustains us. Um, also, in the attributes of God, that God is just and uh, merciful and all powerful and all knowing and uh, things like that. So um, monotheists in general would share um, those kinds of beliefs about God. Uh, but what's interesting is, is as you pointed out, it, it gets more specific in Islam, and, and Muslims agree with us on a lot of things that no one else agrees with us on, right? Um, not a lot of people in the world um, believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, but the Quran says that Jesus was born of a virgin. Um, not a lot of people in the world who aren't Christians believe that Jesus lived the most miraculous life in history. Uh, Muslims do. Um, Jews and Christians have a lot of a lot in common uh, with our uh, in, in terms of theology, but um, unless you un, unless you're a Jew who accepts Jesus as the Messiah, um, Jews wouldn't accept Jesus as the Messiah. Whereas Muslims do; they're required to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, Jesus is going to return and judge the world according to both Islam and Christianity. And so it's, it's Muslims, ha we have a lot in common with Muslims that we don't even have in common with uh, most other groups around the world. And so um, the, the, the point here is that we can, you know, that, that can be very helpful in terms of um, starting off conversations is, is drawing attention to the similarities and sort of working out from there. It, it is astounding, given all the conflict in the world, and uh, talking politically, religiously, even interpersonally, as we interact with with Muslims. And you even mentioned between yourself and Nabil getting into arguments about this stuff all mm -hmm. the time. But we have so much in common; it's amazing. Yeah. Um, I guess that leads to a question. It, I mean, I seem to hear you saying, and from all I've read, it seems like Islam is the closest world religion to Christianity theologically, even closer than Judaism. Would, would that be an accurate statement? Um, it kind of depends on what, on, what, on what you're focusing on, because uh, we share a lot in common, but the, the, where we have the differences, they're, they're pretty significant uh, differences. And there, there, were, there, were, um, there were branches of Judaism that, um, that had a lot more in common uh, with Christianity than we're, than we're usually familiar with when we, when we talk about Judaism, because after the spread of Christianity, Jews tended to, tended to de-emphasize some of these, um, some of these teachings. In other words, uh, there, there were uh, many Jews prior to the spread of Christianity emphasized a plurality within the one God, um, a, a plurality of, of what you might call persons in the one God. Um, so, yeah, on, on, on a lot of important issues, we, we certainly uh, share a lot in common with, uh, with Muslims more so than other groups. So uh, let's, let's dig into that since you opened the door. What, uh, and I've, I've heard other people say there's kind of five major things. What are the points that uh, Muslims would say, uh, draw the line? Like, yeah, there's a lot in common, mm -hmm. but on these few things, this is where we disagree. What's interesting here is that the, the most important differences between Islam and Christianity happen to be along the lines of what the apostles preached as the gospel in the book of Acts. 
So wherever the apostles went, they preached that Jesus died on the cross for sins, that he rose from the dead, confirming his, who he is, and that he is Lord. And so you submit to him. So notice you have death, resurrection, and deity. Uh, wherever the apostles went, they emphasized this. And so these are the people who spent several years learning from Jesus what the gospel is and the takeaway message, because Jesus taught on all kinds of things. Jesus taught on ethics and everything else. Um, but the takeaway message as far as what they wanted to share with the world was the gospel, which according to them had three core elements, Jesus' death, his resurrection, and his divine nature. And as interesting as it is that Muslims agree with us on so much, it's equally interesting that the, the main things they disagree with us on just happen to be the three core teachings of the New Testament gospel. Um, especially when we're told that false prophets and false teachers are going to come into the world and are going to um, corrupt and change the gospel. And we're warned over and over again about people who um, change the gospel. And so uh, it, it's just very interesting. I mean, in other words, if you took the New Testament and you read it and you, you, were, to dis, you were to try and figure out who would, what would kind of the ultimate false prophet be, it would, it would kind of be someone who agrees with us on all kinds of things and yet uh, somehow takes away the gospel. And then, you, you know, six centuries later, um, Muhammad comes along and says, hey, you Christians believe in God? So do I. You believe that, he, that, that, um, that God created the world and that he sent prophets into the world. And uh, you believe that, that Moses and, um, and Abraham and Noah and all these guys are prophets? So do I. Uh, you believe in Jesus? So do we. You believe he's born of a virgin? So do I. You believe he's a Messiah? So do I. You believe he performed all these miracles? I do too. You believe he's returning to judge? I do too. But there are only three little things that we have to disagree on. Um, he didn't die on the cross. He didn't rise from the dead. And he isn't Lord. So if we can, if we can agree on that, then, then we're good to go. And uh, so the Christian response really should have been, "Wow, we've been we've been expecting you because I mean you are you are you you nailed it, man. You you absolutely nailed it. If we were to imagine uh, what the ultimate person would be to lead people away um, from from the gospel, and so it is startling how many things we we agree on. But I would say it's it's also kind of startling that that exactly the three issues that the that the apostles of Jesus named as the the core of the gospel, those are where Islam draws the line. It is fascinating. And I, I mentioned, I, I had heard five, which you alluded to them. They're, they're related. The Trinity. would also be that, that also if, um, I, I've never heard anyone give a list of five, but if I were to guess the other two would be um, the doctrine of the Trinity and uh, the reliability of our scriptures. You nailed it. And that's the five that I hear, because as soon as you start defending the um, resurrection, for example, and you go back to first century text, i.e. the Bible, then the next complaint is, well, your Bible's unreliable, it's been changed. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as you talk about Jesus's claims to deity, then it gets into, well, the Trinity is is a false uh, concept. That word isn't even mentioned in the Bible. I've heard that many times. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, you're right, the, the Trinity and uh, the reliability of Scripture could be subpoints under the other, under the three majors you mentioned. Um, well, uh, so in this context, we, we got a question come in here um, from Ben in Colorado. What's the best way, given all the similarities but the critical differences, how do we best communicate the gospel to Muslims then? Because if we have so much similarity, mm -hmm. uh, but the difference is on the critical, most critical points uh, in, in our Christian faith, i.e. the gospel itself, how, do, mm -hmm. how in the world do we communicate that effectively? Mm -hmm. Um, I would, I would do it by a combination of, of drawing out some implications, other things that, that Muslims know that we agree on, and also bringing out some of the things that, that they don't know that they're, they're supposed to agree with us on. And so, um, what I mean here is if Muslims believe that God is just and that God is merciful. And so they look at Christianity and say, um, well, it would be unjust for one person to take the sins of another upon himself. And so they think that the Christian message actually um, conflicts with God's justice, um, whereas uh, I, and, and so would Nabil, and Nabil does it in his book, draws attention to what perfect justice would look like. Perfect justice would, would demand that all sin be punished. So if we're sinners 
if we're sinners, then justice calls for us to be punished. Um, but mercy, someone who's perfect in mercy would want to forgive. And so sinners present kind of a, a theological problem for a being who has the attributes that God has. Justice is calling for all of us across the board to be punished. Uh, mercy is calling for us to be forgiven. And so if God forgives, if God just says, well, you sin, but since I'm perfect in mercy, I'm going to forgive you all, then that would be very merciful, but it wouldn't be just. Um, likewise, if God said, well, my justice calls for all of you to be punished, therefore I'm just punishing you all, that would be just, but it wouldn't be merciful. And so you have a solution in each religion to what we might call the problem of sin. In Islam, the, the, the solution to this problem is to reduce Allah's attributes. He's not perfect in justice and he's not perfect in mercy. In Islam, um, Allah can just let some sin slide. He can let sin slide. He can say, well, I'm just not punishing those sins. And Muslims say, of course, why not? And the, the, the question is not why not, right? Because they're thinking, of course, Allah is all powerful. Of course, he can just forgive all sins. Yeah, but if he's just forgiving sins, that means that according to Islam, at the end of time, some, some sin has not been punished. There's unpunished sin, and therefore, Allah's justice has not been perfect. Um, likewise, in the, in the area of love and mercy, um, in, in the Bible, we love God because he first loved us. Uh, we're told to love everyone, including our enemies. In Islam, Allah only loves you if you first love him. The Quran says, chapter 3, verse 32, that Allah does not love unbelievers. Many other claims in the Quran talk about all the people, all the different groups that Allah doesn't love. And at the end of the day, Allah only loves you if you're a good Muslim who first loves him. Notice that is the same kind of love that Jesus condemns in Matthew 5, when he says, if you love those who love you, what are you doing more than the, you know, the sinners and the, and the, and the, and the, and the tax collectors and so on? Um, so, uh, in terms of uh, reaching a Muslim, see, the Muslim already believes that Allah is perfect in justice and perfect in his mercy. And if you look, he's not. He's actually not, according to what they believe about how God deals with the problem of humans committing sin. He's not perfect in justice and he's not perfect in mercy. In Christianity, by contrast, which they condemn as unjust, Say what you want, but at the end of time, every last sin has been punished. Either we take the, the punishment, either we take the punishment upon ourselves, or Jesus paid uh, for the punishment uh, on the cross. And so all sin has been punished, and yet God is so loving that he entered into creation to pay the price for our sins. It, you can't possibly be any more loving and merciful than that. And so what they regard as a theological um, deficiency for us, actually, when you dig a little deeper, when you dig deeper, you find that it's, it's, this, it's this solution you find in Christianity that preserves God's perfect attributes. So I would draw attention to things like that. Um, and, and along those lines also, just appeal to um, uh, Muslim intuition on a lot of these things. I mean, I mean I'll, I'll, if I'm having a conversation with, uh, with a Muslim woman who has a, who has a, you know, a child, I'll say, look, if you were, if you were going down the street and you saw your, you saw your, your, your child drowning in a pool of mud and suppose you were, suppose you were even queen of the world or something like that. You ruled the world. You saw your child drowning in a pool of mud. Would you even hesitate to, to jump in there, even though you're wearing royal robes? Um, and, and, Everyone will say, of course not. I wouldn't care about my robes. I would jump in to save my child. And so, you know, point out, if that's how much you love, and you're a mere human being, how much do you think the infinite God would love us? And at the end of the day, Allah just isn't as loving as an, an average human mother. Uh, whereas the God of the Bible is, and so uh, I would point out things like that. But along the lines of what you mentioned, uh, what you mentioned earlier about Muslims having to um, reject our our scriptures. That's interestingly one of the things that Muslims are supposed to agree on, agree with us on, according to their text. But they don't. Every Muslim you run into has been taught that the Bible has been corrupted, that the Torah has been corrupted, that the gospel has been corrupted, and so on. When their texts don't say that, that what what the Quran says um, is that Allah inspired the Torah and the gospel. Muslims know that. That's why they say that our texts have been corrupted. Um, they don't say, oh, your texts your text were never the word of God, uh, which is what I would say to lots of books. If someone brought me a book, I would say, I don't believe in this book. It, well, I wouldn't say it's been corrupted unless I believe that it was originally the inspired word of God. So your average Muslim knows that the 
the Torah and the gospel are the inspired word of God because the Quran says it. If anyone wants to look it up, it's chapter three, verses three to four of the Quran. Um, so your average Muslim knows that. What they don't know is that the Quran, the Quran goes on to affirm the preservation and the authority of the Torah and the gospel. Um, so in chapter seven, verse 157, uh, Allah says that Christians and Jews were still reading the Torah and the gospel. This is during his time. If the, if the Torah and the gospel, the Bible had been corrupted, it had to have been corrupted before the seventh century when Muhammad was along because we have copies of it before then. And yet uh, the Quran is affirming the scriptures of the Jews and Christians that they were reading during the time of Muhammad. And so you have that, you have repeated declarations in the Quran that no one can change Allah's words. So chapter 18, verse 27, no one can change Allah's words. When Muslims tell us that the, the Bible has been corrupted, they're telling us that Allah's words have been changed, which yeah. contradicts the Quran. And even um, in the Quran, Christians and Jews are told to judge by their own scriptures, not by the Quran, which makes no sense if our scriptures have been corrupted. So chapter five, verse 43, uh, interesting historical situation. Some Jews, Muhammad was a political leader by now, and some Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute. And Allah answers by saying to Muhammad, why do they come to you for judgment when they have the Torah? Mm. So what, I mean, think about this. If the Torah has been corrupted, then it makes perfect sense to come to Muhammad because he's got the answers now and the Torah doesn't. The Torah has been corrupted. But that's not Allah's response. Allah's response is, why are they coming to you, Muhammad, when they have they already have the Torah? So they don't need you because they have uh, scriptures from God. And in the historical background, it's found in Sunan Abu Dawud, um, but Muhammad, uh, in the historical background, they sit him on the judgment cushion. There would be a cushion that you sit on to uh, indicate that you are the judge of this dispute. Uh, Muhammad they bring the Torah to Muhammad during this dispute. And Muhammad says to the Torah, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. Very strange if he believes it's been corrupted. But then Muhammad gets off of the cushion and puts the Torah on the cushion, indicating that the Torah is the actual judge of their dispute, which again, makes no sense if the Torah had been corrupted. Uh, but in the Quran there, chapter five, verse 43, where Jews are commanded to judge by the Torah, not by Muhammad, uh, just a few verses later, it says, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. And it says that if we don't judge by what's been revealed to us, that we're no better than rebels. And so the Torah and the gospel are authoritative for Jews and Christians, even in the seventh century when Muhammad is preaching. And just one more, uh, interestingly, it's authoritative. The, the Torah and the gospel are authoritative for Muhammad himself. Um, in chapter 10, verse 94 of the Quran, um, the, Muhammad was having some sort of doubt, which Muslims don't know this either, but Muhammad periodically had doubts about his revelations. Um, but Muhammad was having doubts about whether his revelations were from God. And Allah responds by saying, if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. So Allah's response is for Muhammad to go to Jews and Christians and to ask if his revelations line up with our revelations, which here again would make no sense if our revelations have been corrupted. If our revelations have been corrupted, then why would you be making sure that your revelations line up with corrupt revelations? Doesn't make sense at all. And so you never find um, that our scriptures have been corrupted in the Quran. The reason Muslims believe in the corruption of our texts is because the Quran is, is telling us that our scriptures line up with his scriptures and Muslims believed this for a couple of generations. Eventually, they started going through our scriptures and realizing these scriptures don't line up with Islam. And so they're forced to say they've our scriptures have been corrupted, which the correct response would have been, wait a minute, if Muhammad affirms our scriptures and our scriptures contradict Islam, Islam kind of self-destructs there because there are only two possibilities. Either we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, or we don't. If Christians have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false because Islam contradicts our scriptures on basic doctrines like the death, resurrection, and deity of Jesus. If we don't have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false because the Quran says that we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. So if Christians have the word of God, Islam is false. If Christians don't have the word of God, Islam is false. Either way, Islam would have to be false. And this is what happens if your book affirms scriptures that contradict it on on fundamental doctrines but here here this is just something that muslims just don't know and it's it's another 
part of that common ground that we share, but unlike, um, you know, them knowing that we all believe in one God or that we all believe that Jesus um, performed miracles or something like this, your average Muslim um, doesn't know this sort of thing because they've just been told all their lives that the Quran uh, affirms that our scriptures have been corrupted. And so I, I think it, it, there are lots of ways you can go there um, by, uh, by appealing to the common ground that we have and, and sometimes the common ground that they don't actually know that we have in, uh, in um, sharing the gospel and even just emphasize, you know, it, just what they believe about Jesus. So we talked about th their belief in the attributes of God and how those actually lead to the gospel and not to, uh, not to the Islamic view, but um, their beliefs about Jesus, it, it can be very helpful to say, um, you know, Jesus is born of a virgin Muhammad's not. Jesus lives the most miraculous life. Muhammad's only miracle is the Quran. Um, God rescues Jesus from death in Islam. Won't allow him to die. Muhammad was poisoned by a Jewish woman to death in, in Islam. And Jesus is coming back to judge the world. Of all the prophets in the Quran, there are about 25 uh, mentioned by name in the Quran. Um, of all the prophets, why is there this emphasis on Jesus so much? Why is Jesus sinless? Why, why Jesus? Mm -hmm. And in Islam, there's just no good reason except for Allah decided it to be that way. In Christianity, it makes perfect sense for Jesus to be so radically different from other people in terms of his birth, um, his life, and his death, and afterwards. Je the uniqueness of Jesus makes perfect sense from a, from a Christian perspective because Jesus is completely unique. He is one of a kind. In Islam, he's not one of a kind. So why is Jesus so radically different in Islam? So there are lots of different directions um, you can you can go there. And I would say just just pick the one you're most comfortable with, and um, pick the one you're most comfortable with, and and go with that. Oh, just, just be, since Nabil mentioned uh, mentioned one more um, that would also be good. It's good to learn these verses when uh, Muslims say that you know. Christianity is unjust because Jesus dies for the sins of others, whereas Islam is just because each person dies for his own sins. Um, one, the, contradic the Quran contradicts itself on this point. The Quran uh, in certain places says that uh, no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another, but in other passages um, says that some people will bear the burdens of others. So the Quran isn't consistent on this point. But what Nabil points out is that uh, all of these verses which say that no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. It's talking about a burden of sin here. No bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. These verses don't say what Muslims think they say. Muslim will a Muslim will read that to me and say, look, the Quran says right here, no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. So in Islam, no one can bear the burdens of others. It doesn't say no one can bear the burdens of others. The Quran says no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. The underlying idea is sound theology. If I have a burden of sin, which I do, then it makes no sense for me to say, oh God, I'm going to take his sins upon me as well. Um, if I'm a sinner, I'm under God's judgment. I'm in no position to tell God that I'm taking what I'm doing with other people's sins. I'm already under judgment. The Quran doesn't say no one shall bear the burden of another. It says no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. In other words, no one who already has a burden of sin can then go out and pay the price for other people's sins. It just doesn't, you, it doesn't work like that. The door that that leaves wide open is for someone who has no burden of sin, which according to Islam, Jesus has no burden of sin. Um, he's, called blameless in the, he's called blameless in the Quran. And in the Hadith, Muhammad says that Satan touches every child born into the world except Jesus, whom he could not touch. So, so I mean, it, the, the Muslim sources are kind of leaving the door wide open for a gospel message. And I would just encourage people uh, to learn those issues because lots of m objections that Muslims have, lots of objections that they bring to Christians, you can actually turn them, they, they, they turn very nicely into a gospel message. So a Muslim, when he comes to you and says, it's unfair and unjust, for Jesus to take the you know the, the penalty for sins upon himself, the Muslim thinks that he's 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 stumped you and he's got you theologically cornered, and you can actually take that, start to respond to it, bring out even what the Quran says to get him thinking about some of the theological um, implications of what the Quran says. That some of these pastors are actually crying out for something like the gospel, which you don't have uh, right. in Islam.
it, it is interesting to me, and in my interactions with Muslims, I find that um, they're impressed that I've actually read the Quran because it's not super common, and I'm not trying to insult anyone, but it's it's not super common that uh, Muslims have even read the Quran, especially overseas, where the Quran was written originally in Arabic and uh, very difficult seventh century classical Arabic. And um, so you find folks that their first language isn't Arabic, have not digested it, even though they've memorized the prayers and uh, and can converse a wee bit. Um, so yeah, and, and and just just because that that's that, that's actually an important point because um, um, I used to think that that Muslims were much more knowledgeable about their religion than Christians were, and there's a reason for that. If you see Muslims, that many of them are dressing a certain way and they're going to the mosque at certain times and um, they're doing their daily prayers. You know, I, I would meet with Nabil and he would break out his prayer rug and things like that. Um, so so they seem to be very, very devoted to their religion. And the, the reason for that is you can be in Islam because everything has been condensed for you. Um, so you, the, the basic practices have been condensed into the five pillars. So you have to recite the, the creed and you have to perform your daily prayers and you have to give alms and so on. Uh, and the beliefs have also been condensed into the six articles of faith. You have to believe in God and angels and prophets and books and so on. So you can actually be a Muslim and just know those lists and know that you have to believe what the what the list requires and do what the list requires and not know much else. And it was just it was shocking to me when it was after debates when uh, Muslims would come up and start challenging me on something that I had said and said, oh, you're wrong about this and, and so on. And it was clear that they didn't know what the Quran taught on this. And so I'd say, what would you, what do you do about this verse of the Quran? And they would say, well, let's read it. And they just had no clue what I was talking about. Right. And um, the, the, the reason is that in Islam, this is, a, this is actually part of what Islam teaches that has, has led to a sort of two-tier system in, in Islam, where you have your scholars who know it all, and you have other people who right. are just encouraged to do what your scholars say. And, and the, the, the reason is that in the Quran, uh, chapter 4, verse 65, uh, Muslims are told that if they... Uh, disagree with Muhammad on anything, they're not real Muslims. It says, uh, uh, you have no real faith unless you submit to Muhammad in everything and find no resistance against any of Muhammad's decisions. And so the idea here is that you've got the Quran and you've got Muhammad's teachings in these massive multi-volume collections of hadiths. Hadith, right. If you just read something in the Quran and you don't know the historical background and uh, whether this has been abrogated and all, you don't know all kinds of other things, the commentaries and so on, you might interpret that in some way that conflicts with Muhammad's understanding and you might actually disagree with Muhammad on something and you might actually be going to hell and not even realizing it. And this is combined with Muhammad saying that uh, the sin of innovation, so coming up with your own view or your own interpretation or your own practice, uh, is punishable by hell. You're going to hell if you come up with your own way of doing things in religion. Mm -hmm. And so you either, the, the, the result over the centuries has been, you either need to learn all of this so you're not messing up. Uh, so you, when you read a verse, you know what the commentator said about this, you know what Muhammad's companion said about this, you know what Muhammad thought about this, you know the historical background. Uh, you either learn it all or you just keep quiet and do what your leaders yeah. say. And so your average Muslim, despite what I used to think, your average Muslim knows next to nothing. And, and the reason that's important is when you bring out uh, what we've already mentioned, what the Quran says about the reliability of our scriptures or what the Quran actually says when it says that um, no bearer of burden shall bear the burdens of others. Um, your average Muslim hasn't read any of this. And so ironically, we're the ones oftentimes in these discussions who will be teaching Muslims about what Islam teaches. Yeah, it's interesting to me that uh, I often had the stereotype, uh, we lived in the Middle East for a long time, and before we left, uh, I think it's fairly typical of being afraid to enter into those conversations, but I find Muslims some of the most enjoyable people to talk to about religion, spirituality, theology, because they're so engaged in it. They want to know. Mm -hmm. And we share so much in common. And when they discover how much more we have in common that they maybe didn't know, as you've, mm -hmm. as you've demonstrated, uh, then it becomes quite a discussion. Um, and most of the time, in fact, I'd say 99% of the time, I find those conversations go swimmingly well. Uh, of course, you you inevitably get into those touchy subjects, like we mentioned, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, the, the deity of Christ. Um, 
Uh, we had a question come in that I wanted to throw out by uh, a watcher uh, who's a Muslim. And he says, I, I hear uh, about the Gospels through one of my friends. Understand it's a long story. But the most disturbing fact that I can't get over is this father-son relationship. I find it difficult to comprehend that Jesus was the son of God. Uh, help me understand, he says, this attribute of son. What mm -hmm. kind of answer would you give? And this is going to help Christians, too, that have the same uh, question posed to them, perhaps. What, what kind of answer would you give to that? Um, well, th that would actually be uh, uh, an in-depth discussion because the, the Bible uses the, the phrase son of God in a variety of ways. So in the Old Testament, Israel is called uh, God's son. Um, Adam is the son of God in a sense, and that, and that God is, is directly um, creating Adam. Um, the, we're told that we can be children of God, right? So blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God. So there are sons of God in different senses, but when we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about something uh, that's unique to Jesus. Um, but it, it's interesting the way the theology all ties together that because Jesus is the unique Son of God in the divine sense, that he's actually the supreme example of the Son of God in all the other senses of the, of the phrase Son of God um, in the Bible. Um, but uh, in, in terms of when we talk about Jesus being the Son, in the New Testament, this, this has two senses that are unique to Jesus. And one is that Jesus does the same thing that the Father does. And this is this one is kind of foreign to us. It would have been perfectly understandable in the first century that when you said you're you're the carpenter, that meant your father was the carpenter. When you said that you're the butcher, that meant that your father was the butcher. I think it was upwards of ninety five percent of people in the ancient of sons in the ancient world will do what their father did. Trades were passed down by families, and so we find this sense specifically in uh, in John chapter five. When, which is interestingly a passage that Muslims quote to try and disprove the deity of Christ because Jesus says in that chapter, of my own self, I can do nothing. And they say, you see there, Jesus says that he can't do anything of himself. When you look at what he's actually saying in there, you can't understand that chapter without the doctrine of the Trinity. And what you see in that chapter is that because Jesus is calling himself the son of God, the religious leaders accuse him of claiming to be another God, which would have been a violation of, mono, of Jewish monotheism, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a bad accusation that he's claiming to be another God. And Jesus responds by claiming to do the same things that the Father does while claiming that he's not a separate God. And, and it's in that context that he says, of my own self, I can do nothing. In other words, separate from the Father, he can do nothing. So he's affirming that he's one with the Father, that, he, that he's not doing something as a separate God, that he is one. So that is part of, uh, a part of the divine unity there, that claim. But Muslims sort of rip that out of context. But the rest of what he says in that passage is, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son raises the dead. And he says that at the, at the final judgment, he's the one. All the dead will hear his voice and will rise. And he, in that same chapter, he says that he's the final judge, that he's the final judge who decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Notice both of these things, according to both Judaism and Christianity and Islam, God is the one who raises the dead at the resurrection and judges them. Jesus claims that he can do, that he's the one who's going to do these things. And so there you find Jesus saying, just as the Father does this, so also I do this. And so there's that sense of son of God, that he carries on sort of the family trade, right? Jesus carries on the family trade, but the family trade of God is creating the world and judging the dead and raising the dead and so on. He's saying he carries on the, no one, no human, certainly no Islamic prophet could say that he carries on the family trade of God in judging the world and raising the dead and so on. But that's what Jesus claims. Yeah. Um, but the yeah. other more familiar... One of the common misconceptions uh, that might be helpful to our Muslim viewers, just to set this straight, and many times when Christians say Trinity, what Muslims think, and many times have been taught, is that the Trinity is God, Jesus, and Mary. And that's not at all what we're talking about. And so this idea of sonship, uh, identity with, uh, with God the Father, 
is not a physical sonship. That's not no. what we're talking about. Um, it's, so it's, just to clarify that, that's not what Christians believe. We yeah. would say haram we, to yeah, that too. Not, yeah, we do not believe that God produced an offspring. But that's what's interesting here is that Allah did not understand what Christians believe. And here's 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 the, what you just brought up. So this is chapter 5, verse 116 of the Quran, which, uh, uh, so throughout chapter 5, Muslims are told, to tell Christians, hey, that you're not supposed to say that God's a trinity and so on, um, deny constant denials of the deity of Christ. And there at the end of the chapter, um, we find the only place in, in, in the Quran where Allah describes the doctrine of the trinity, and it's a trinity made up of God, Jesus, and Mary. And they're not even they're not even one in essence or nature. They're three separate gods who sort of work together closely. And no Christian group, heretical or otherwise, has ever taught that. And so we, we, here we have to wonder, why doesn't Allah understand what we're, what we're teaching? Even if Allah wants to reject what we're teaching about God, we would at least expect Allah to get it right, right? In other words, if I'm responding to your view, it would make sense for me to say, here's your view, and to state it accurately, and then to say, and here's why your view is wrong. When Allah wants to respond, all we can conclude is that Either Allah doesn't know what the doctrine of the Trinity is, in which case he would be ignorant of that, uh, or he does know what the doctrine of the Trinity is, and he deliberately misrepresents it, in which case that would be deceptive. So you, you'd have to take your pick there. But yes, Christians don't believe that God produced um, an offspring. Now, what's interesting is how the Quran denies these sorts of things. Um, uh, we're told, um, how can uh, so when the, the doctrine of God having a son is brought up, the Quranic response is, how can Allah have a son when he has no wife, right? So Allah can't have a son without having a wife to have a physical offspring with. But how is that a response to what we believe? That's not what Christians mean at all by saying that God has a son. So this isn't a response to us. What's interesting is Mary asks the exact same thing when she's told that she's going to have a son. And she says, how can I have, how can I have a son when no man has known me? And what's Allah's response? I mean, well, the angel Gabriel's response, it's easy for God. Now, wait a minute. In one passage, Allah can't have a son unless there's uh, a sexual relationship between a man and a woman. In another passage, Mary asks, how can, I have, how can I have a son if I don't have sex with a man? And the response is, it's easy for God. And so we, we just don't know what, what the situation here is. Uh, but when, just for, for, the, for the, uh, the, the Muslim who asked the question, when we say that Jesus is the Son of God, we are not at all, at all, at all talking about God having an offspring. Uh, the, at the Son, Jesus as the Son, that's an eternal relationship within the Trinity. In other words, God has always been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, within the one God. Now, what's what's interesting here is Muslims will, oh, that's polytheism and so on, without realizing, as Nabil often points out, that you have similar things in Islam. They're not the same, but they're similar enough to where if you find a problem with that, you've just thrown out Islam. So Muslims believe that the Quran is an eternal book. The Quran is Allah's eternal speech constantly proceeding from him. It's eternal, right? So in Islam, you have two eternal things. You have Allah and Allah's speech. Mm -hmm. Now, is Allah's speech the eternal Quran? Is that another God? It has it has attributes of God. It's eternal, right? It ha it's eternal. So is that is that uh, is that polytheism? And Muslims would say, no, 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 no. Well, how you have something besides God that has God's attributes, and so you have to emphasize this this sort of oneness here. And apart from that, think because we were talking about attributes of God um, earlier. Think about this: Is Allah's justice? the same thing as his mercy? And the answer is no, they're different. And we're even told that Allah's mercy triumphs over his, ju his judgment or his justice. So notice you have two attributes of, of Allah and they're in conflict and disagreeing with one another and one wins over another. Would you say, would Muslims say that therefore there must be these two gods within the one God? No, they wouldn't, they wouldn't say that. And so notice, you Muslims even believe in a plurality in multiple senses. You believe that there's there's a plurality of eternal things. So there's the eternal God and then his eternal book, the Quran. 
And within the one God, you believe that there is a plurality of attributes, and these attributes can even be in conflict with another and with one another and be calling on God to do different things. So if you're talking about God's nature or essence, you would say God is one. But if you're talking about the level of attribute, you would say God is more than one. So notice what you're saying there. God is one in one sense. He's more than one in another sense, right? So God is one in one sense. He's more than one in another sense. Well, that's what Christians say. Christians ha Christians, Christians believe that God is, is completely one in essence or nature. Um, we also believe in the level of attribute, that God has different attributes and so on. But Christians also say that God, um, that th there's a plurality in the sense of person, that is within the one God, there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so you can say, that's not true, that doesn't make any sense. Guess what? God was not consulting us when he decided how he's going to be. God is what he is. And so what's up to us, what we have to do, is when God tells us what he's like, we need to accept that as revelation. Even if you don't, even if you don't get it or can't get your mind around it, guess what? That's not a requirement for, for something being true. I've tried studying quantum mechanics. I can't get my mind around it, right? I can't understand it. That does not mean it's not true. Me not getting, I mean, I can I, I don't understand electricity very well. I took physics. I took I can't, I just don't understand it very well. That has nothing to do with whether it's true or not. And so, uh, one, if if we're if you're saying that God can be one in one sense and more than one in another sense, as Muslims have to claim, um, then who are we to say that God can't be as He is described in Scripture? If you really want to submit to God, you should be saying something along these lines, which is what I said when I became a Christian: um, Jesus rose from the dead, and we know this historically. Jesus died on the cross. Every shred of historical evidence we have tells us that. And he was alive again later. Every shred of historical evidence we have t tells us that as well. So there we have someone rising from the dead. If I'm going to listen to anyone tell me about God, I'm going to listen to him. So if someone's going to tell me about God, I'm going to listen to the one who rose from the dead. What did he tell me about God? This is the same guy who, after his resurrection, sent his followers to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who am I to tell the one who rose from the dead that I disagree with his concept of God because it's confusing to some people? And it's you bring up an interesting, uh, allude to an interesting passage there too, because Jesus says right before that statement, all authority in heaven has been given to me. And one of the things that the Bible tells us is that his resurrection demonstrated his authority. So sonship is not just um, a, a place in the family. It's not just a relationship, although that concept of Trinity is very important, that, that that eternal relationship existed well before the creation of the world. But sonship is also a position. Uh, that it's a, a place of honor. You think about firstborn son in Near East culture, that, uh, that's a very helpful explanation um, for the place that Jesus holds. Uh, as far as his relationship in the Godhead, that he has been given all authority uh, over planet Earth, creation. He's the one even that the Bible says has created everything uh, by his powerful word. So his position in that uh, Godhead is one of authority. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about sonship, not an offspring born, created, uh, and some kind of lesser being. Um, let's switch gears a minute. We've talked about uh, sin quite a bit uh, just in this discussion. What uh, are the main differences between the concept and the concept of sin in Islamic theology and and in Christianity? Uh, well, well, Nabil points out one of the ways to um, distinguish um, between this um, in, in that in, in Christianity, your 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 main problem in the world, the main problem in the world is is sin, whereas in Islam it seems to be um, ignorance, right? You just didn't know. Um, you can you can rebel against God once you do know, but the main problem is is people need to know. So that the main cause of people not doing what Allah wants is they didn't know. Once you know, and then you don't do something, then then you are in in rebellion in in something along the lines of a of a Christian sense. You also have some differences in the in the the idea of of a uh, uh, of original sin and so on. Although he, although even here, I think Muslims just haven't read their uh, their their scriptures and their texts very well. But um, uh, the way the way 
Beale describes, and we can understand it this way, it's uh, Islam is the religion of submission, right? So it, the word Islam means submission. We have to submit to God. Now, insofar as saying that we need to submit to God, that's something any Jew or any Christian would agree with. Uh, we need to submit to God. Um, but Islam isn't just a religion that tells you how that tells you that you must submit to God. It tells you how you must submit to God, and well, you to the letter submit, and in great detail, right? Yeah, yeah. You submit to God by unquestioningly uh, doing what Muhammad uh, told you to do, and so this is where we have to disagree. Um, you 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 believe what Muhammad told you to believe, and you do what Muhammad told you to do. And this is yeah, I, I, this is incredibly intricate. This is this is a manual of Sharia right here. So. So this is a list of, of what you're supposed to do. Um, but the, uh, the idea in Islam is it's, it's not just sort of big issues like don't kill or something like that. Um, don't steal. It, it, can, it, it involves those things. Don't commit adultery. It involves those and the penalties as well. But Islam goes all the way down to um, telling you how to go to the bathroom, that you step into the bathroom with your left foot first, that you how to brush your teeth. Yeah, it tells you, yeah, it tells you how to go to the bathroom. And so what you find in Islam is that people just didn't know how to please Allah. And now you do because Muhammad has given you the example. Now you know how to go to the bathroom in a way that pleases Allah. Now you know how to do all these things in a way that pleases Allah. And if you don't do them now that the messenger has been sent, then you're just in a, a state of uh, state of rebellion. So the main problem was people just didn't know what to do. And now um, now those who have submitted to Allah now now they know you you do everything Muhammad said and taught you to do, and then. Uh, you might be in good with God, but you don't really know because he's a, he's, he can be a little unpredictable at times. And let me clarify something, too, for our listeners. I, you hear in the media, too, Islam is a religion of peace. And um, indeed, the Arabic root, Salama, it, it, one of the meanings is peace. But the idea in Islam is peace achieved through submission to God and his rules. And uh, so that's an important concept. We, we hear these differing dialogues in the media. Islam is peace. Islam is, is submission. Um, and so that's a, a helpful explanation. Um, so how then do we explain the atonement? If that's the, the Islamic concept of sin, that it, it's, it, it, we can't really know whether we've, and again, the concept of uh, eternal judgment is, it, does my sin outweigh my, my good works? Um, so how in the world in that kind of context can Christians communicate the idea of substitutionary and atonement? Uh, well, here again, I, I think there's an issue where, um, Muslims should read their sources and read what their prophets said. So if, if we if we put it all together with what we what we uh, mentioned earlier, that uh, the Quran doesn't say no one can bear the burdens of others. It says no bearer of burden shall bear the burdens of another, uh, and that even in the Quran, some people do. Uh, some people are said to bear the burdens of others. And I made a video on this title. If anyone wants to look at all the passages and examine them and think about them, I put them all in um, in a video titled. Uh, how can God punish Jesus for the sins of others? So if someone wants to look that up, um, but going to all, interrupt you, give us, give us the web address for your YouTube channel while you're at it. Uh, it's just act 17 apologetics. So you go on YouTube and type in, if you, if you just go on YouTube and type in David Wood, a bunch of stuff, uh, a bunch of my stuff and a bunch of stuff from people who don't like <laughs> me will, will pop up. So there's plenty, plenty of stuff there. Um, but in the, in the, in the Hadith, in the Hadith, Muhammad repeatedly says that uh, if Muslims have sins as heavy as a mountain, Allah will take the sins off the Muslim, put them on the backs of Jews and Christians, and Jews and Christians will be punished for those sins. These are not weird, off-the-wall hadiths. These are in your main collection like Sahih Muslim. So it doesn't get any better than Sahih Muslim in Islam. And there are multiple passages in there where Muhammad says, that Allah will punish Jews and Christians for the sins of Muslims. In other words, here's the situation that was presented um, in Islam, that for a while Muhammad is saying, hey, you know, each person's going to pay for his own sins. Allah can forgive some of these little sins as long as you're really dedicated to him. But apparently some Muslims come to him after a while saying, look, I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that. And the question is, how is Allah going to forgive all of these sins that I've done? 
And there you can't just say Allah is going to brush those sins under the rug. And so there, Muhammad, Muhammad's response to that was, if you have sins uh, as heavy as a mountain, Allah is going to take those sins and put them on the sins uh, on the backs of Jews and Christians. Now notice, what is this is substitutionary atonement, right? This is, you're going to be okay because someone else is going to pay the price for your sins. And if, 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 the, if the conversation on this issue started off with, it's unjust for God to punish one person for the sins of another, great, Muhammad's a false prophet, Muslims, you need a new religion now, because Muhammad taught, the same one who received the Quran, said that Jews and, Christi Jews and Christians will be punished for the sins of Muslims. And so I would point out those passages um, would draw attention to what the Quran says about no bear of burden, uh, bearing the burden of another, and point out what's the solution here. If, according to Muhammad, someone can accept the punishment for the sins of others, and the only sort of open door, really, according to the Quran, is someone who has no burden of sin, and according to Islam, Jesus is the only one who has no burden of sin, how can you look at the Christian message and saying, this is the message that's off limits? It's the only message that makes sense of even what the Quran and Muhammad say about uh, God and sin. Fascinating. Let's, so uh, we're almost out of time here, but let's close with where we started, um, which was kind of the, the question of similarities uh, between Christianity and Islam. And let me just ask the question that precipitated Nabil writing this whole book. Are <laughs> Allah and the Christian God the same? Uh, is there one God and, and who is he? Um. If someone were just to say, hey, do we worship the same God? I would I'd say, what do you mean? Do we both worship a creator of the world? In that sense, yes. Um, so there, there's the, how similar are they and how different are they? Because, you know, Christians might have, Christians have different views on things like, does God, um, you know, God's predestination, does God determine everything? Or, you know, what's the role of free will? So Christians have differences there. We don't want to say you worship another God because you have some sort of, some sort of difference there. Um, so the question is, are we far, are we so similar that the differences, you know, aren't that significant or are we different enough to where we can say we're worshiping different gods? Well, um, I mean, the, the, the fundamental doctrine of, of, the, of the nature of God in Christianity is the Trinity. Islam explicitly rejects that. And when we look at, at God's attributes, we find that, that the solution to the problem of, that sin creates is to reduce God's attributes. Um, and, you know, in Christianity, God loves us before we love him. In Islam, we have to love God first and then he'll love us. So uh, when it comes to atonement and all these other things, I'd say we certainly um, have some important similarities. But at, at the end of the day, this is this is not the same God we're talking about, which which means that we're in a, we're in a situation um, similar to. Uh, Paul in uh, in Acts 17, where he, he talks to people there who, who would have had even far more differences than we have with Muslims. We have more similarities with Muslims than Paul had with the pagans. Um, but it, it is enough for us to say you're worshiping God in ignorance because you haven't followed a lot of these, a lot of your own beliefs through to the logical conclusion, and you haven't noticed a lot of the problems with your your theology. And so we're here to we're, we're here to, to discuss these things with you. It's an important distinction to make in answering that question in conversations with our Muslim neighbors and coworkers. I, I find it somewhat uh, divisive when people just snap, no, we don't worship the same God, because there are so many similarities, as we pointed out. And it can be a great opening to discussing the very, very important differences and uh, atonement, which is the, the core of the gospel. Uh, so do we worship the same God? Well, yes and no, uh, because our concepts of God on the, on the extremely important things are very, very different. And, and, and by, by, the way, by the way, on a side note, if you're, if you're dealing with someone who is sort of uh, picking a fight and wanting you to say the mean thing so that they can disagree with you, you can always flip it right back on them and just say, okay, I believe in the, the triune God who uh, the, the son enters creation to die on the cross for sins and, and so on. Um, is that the God you believe in? You believe in that God? If so, then great, you're a Christian. And so you flip it back on them, and they, they're either in a position to say, yes, we worship the same God, in which case, congratulations, uh, say a sinner's prayer or something. Um, yeah, or they have to say on they the other side, it. often we find in, in this uh, desire to be pluralist and inclusive, uh, we're, we're glossing over these very important differences. 
which uh, again, most Muslims are very happy to talk about and talk through and debate, and that's perfectly fine. We we have uh, this kind of uh, cultural uh, thing here where we don't talk about religion and politics at dinner. Well, with most Muslims, I found the exact opposite to be true. If you don't talk about religion and politics, you're not being kind guest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's perfectly fine to talk through these things and debate them. Um, uh, David, so appreciate your time. Thank you uh, for explaining some of these things. Uh, appreciate your knowledge on this. I just want to remind our listeners again um, that uh, this is the first in a three-part discussion series. The next will be January 25th, and then uh, on February 1st will be our third. Uh, 